Seven is a key number in the book of Revelation. There are three groups of seven found in the book of Revelation, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials. Well, on this edition of End of the Age, we're going to analyze the seven trumpets and we'll unveil what these mysterious prophetic symbols could be in our modern understanding. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Robbins with End Time Ministries. Thank you so much for joining me on this edition of End of the Age. Yes, I did make it into work. Um, we've got ice and snow everywhere here in Dallas. I know it's across much of the United States, and uh, but we did actually make it in today. I had a, a, one of our producers come and get me in his four-wheel drive pickup, so I'm thankful for that to Brian Horde today. But... On today's lesson, we're going to be talking about the seven trumpets. In the book of Revelation, the number seven is very, very important. There are seven seals, seven trumpets. There were actually seven thunders, but we were told it's uh, Revelation chapter 10, but we, John was told not to write the, what those thunders uttered. And that's what everybody wants to know. What about the seven thunders? So we don't talk about them much as far as a skeletal structure. But when we talk about the seals, trumpets, and vials, yes, they are the main skeletal structure in the book of Revelation. And the seven seals are the long story, ending at the, the second coming in the Battle of Armageddon. They started back in about 300, 325 A.D. with the formation of the um, Roman Universal Doctrine or the Roman Catholic Church. Then the seal, or I should say the seven trumpets, they're a shorter story which we'll talk about today. And they also end at the second coming in the Battle of Armageddon. And then the vials are a very short story that have not occurred yet. They're at the end of the Great Tribulation. And they also end at, again at the second coming in the Battle of Armageddon. It's just several accounts of the second coming of Jesus Christ in the very near future. But these accounts started at different times throughout history. So the seven vials, they don't actually take place um, until after the mark of the beast is administered at the end of the great tribulation. And we know this because when the first vial is unleashed, the Bible says that it will be unleashed upon the people that have taken the mark of the beast. And so from that, we know that it will be enacted at the time of the very end. So it's very important because what we're going to do today is we're going to help you understand that the book of Revelation is not written in chronological order. The skeletal structure of the book of Revelation and Revelation 119, where John was told to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which will be hereafter, these help us to know the book of Revelation is not written in chronological order. If you try to read the book of Revelation like it was written in chronological order, you're going to be very messed up because you're going to have several things happening um, several times in the near future. And like the wrath of God, you'll have that happening four times in the future. And it only happens once. So you've got to understand this. Now, not only are, is there a skeletal structure in the book of Revelation of the seven seals, trumpets, and vials, but the book of Revelation also has parenthetical or more explanatory explanatory, I should say, chapters. Uh, it's kind of like color commentary. Um, John's riding along and he's doing the skeletal structure and then he says, whoa, 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 hold on. I got to take one chapter and I got to really explain something in great detail. So that's the parenthetical chapters. And um, then, you, that, so it's color commentary. And then in addition to the main overview of the book of Revelation, 
Sometimes there is these additional chapters, parenthetical. For example, um, chapter 12, that's a parenthetical chapter. It tells about a war in heaven when Satan is cast down and confined to the earth for three and a half years. The Bible says, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because Satan comes down to you having great wrath. And he, purchased the, he per persecuted the woman, which is Israel in Revelation 12, and then those that have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the church. Then Revelation 13, it's another parenthetical chapter. It gives a view of the world government and the Antichrist, the one world religion, and the false prophet who will be the leader of that one world religion, and, it also, the, and also the mark of the beast, the economic system of the end time world government. And so if you understand the skeletal structure of, the, of Revelation and that some of the chapters are parenthetical where John's giving color commentary to some specific events, then uh, that they're included, it gives a fuller understanding and it will help you better understand the Revel book of Revelation as a whole. And like we've said before, there are many times where uh, a pastor or somebody they don't even want to mess with the book of Revelation because it gets it, you can jump in back and forth and there's beast and all kinds of things. And, you know, honestly, it's probably best if you stay away from it if you don't understand it, right? You can really just get way off. But it's better to understand it and then you can teach it to whoever, your Bible study, a congregation, and, um, because you, it's the book of Revelation. It's the revealing of Jesus Christ told over and over and over again, and it's such, such an awesome book. So one final example of a parenthetical chapters would be chapter 17 and 18. That provides the identity of the ruler of the end time false religious system and God's judgment that is going to be poured out upon that entity in the last days. That's why we say in the end time you absolutely cannot be part of the end time world religious system. You can't be, if your church is getting sucked up into all these interfaith movements and all these things, you need to get straight away from that because that's what this um, world religion is going to be made up of. Any kind of religion or belief system, and they're saying, hey, you can be saved. It's okay. Just come and let's, have, let's just have tolerance and everybody just get along. Well, that's, everybody getting along is a good thing. Everybody loving one another, that's a good thing but not if you have to push the doctrines of the Bible under the rug to be able to do that. It doesn't work like that because we're trying to get people to heaven, you understand? So today we're going to talk about the seven trumpets. So let's get into it. Um, when we talk about, the first one I want to go to is Revelation 8, 6. And the Bible says, And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound... Now, we're not going to, to discuss the, the trumpets in order, and I think I'm going to hold right here because I want to make sure you understand why. We're going to jump back and forth through the different trumpets, um, and you need to know why I'm going to do that because I'm, we're going to be going through here, and I'm going to jump from, um, I'm going to start off with trumpet number three, and you're going to be sitting there going, wonder why he's doing that. Well, I'm going to explain that. Uh, when we get back on the other side of the break. Major internet companies are silencing and censoring Christian voices online. These companies are trying to control what you see and hear. Almost 200 videos of ours have been marked as restricted online right now. That's why we launched End of the Age Plus, a platform where the truth won't be censored, a platform where we can preach the message of the gospel. When you subscribe to End of the Age Plus today for just $12.99 a month, you can watch all of our content in a secure, easy-to-view way from your favorite device. When you go to watch.endtime.com and subscribe, you'll get instant access to all of our teaching resources, including Revelation, the Unveiling of Jesus Christ, Understanding the End Time, End Time Magazine, and so much more. We will not censor our message to comply with what the world deems as politically correct. Go to watch.endtime.com right now or search End of the Age Plus in the App Store or Google Play. We've seen Bible prophecy fulfilled like never before. 
From the halls of the United Nations to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, End Time Ministries continues to reveal the Bible prophecy in the news headlines around the world every day. Whether it's through our broadcast or online at our Jerusalem Prophecy College, your gifts enable us to put vital materials in the hands of those who need it most. Because of you, we continue to replace fear with faith in the hearts of Christians around the world. We will continue to see prophecy come to pass at an even swifter pace. We need your support. Your donation of any amount enables us to continue to broadcast and be a voice in the ever-growing censored media. To become a partner or give a one-time gift, visit endtime.com or call 1-800-END-TIME right now. That's 800-363-8463. Go online now. Visit endtime.com. Now, before we get off into the seven trumpets, I've got to announce a, a prophecy conference that we're going to be doing this Saturday and Sunday down in Houston. And you say, well, it's freezing down there. Well, it's going to be 60 degrees this coming Saturday. It's going to be warm. It's going to be nice. You can come out and have a, we'll have a great prophecy conference um, on Saturday, the February 20th, 6 to 8 p.m., I'll be teaching the new lesson from the future according to Bible prophecy. It's this awesome timeline I'm teaching through. And then on Sunday morning, February 21, from 11 to 1, I'll be teaching a, an updated breaking prophetic fulfillments. And then we'll have a time of q and I think you'll really enjoy that. And then we'll be at the Christ Church. We've been there many times at 12815 Fuqua Street. That's F-U-Q-U-A Street in Houston, and the phone number down there, 281-481-3222. So I look forward to seeing you all down there on a 60-degree day Saturday. Um, and what a great conference that we'll have. We've always had a great conference there. So join us in Houston this coming Saturday and Sunday. Okay, so now <clears throat> we're not going to discuss the trumpets in order. Why? Because we are, we're going to go over them in the same order that God revealed them to my father-in-law, Irvin Baxter. And because it's going to help us understand them, and I understand why God did this once we go through here. So we're going to look at the third trumpet first, okay? So the Bible says, Revelation 10, 11, or I'm sorry, Revelation 8, verses 10 and 11. The Bible says, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven. Now you understand John, 2,000 years ago, John's trying to explain a vision of what he's seen in a future event. So he's doing the best he can to explain something 2,000 years in the future. So imagine that. So when John says in this vision, hey, when the third angel sounded, I saw a great star fall from heaven, burning as it were as a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the waters and upon the fountains of the waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died because of the waters. So, in this was all the way back in what, 1995. Irvin Baxter uh, was working on the first edition of the manual for our course, Understanding the End Time. And he had heard that the word Chernobyl, you got all kinds of people sending us all kinds of information. Somebody had sent him some information that the word Chernobyl was the Russian word for wormwood. Well, he stopped what he was doing. He called the library and he asked the reference librarian to look up the Russian word for wormwood uh, to see if it was Chernobyl. God had kind of impressed upon him to do that. He's working on this manual, and God said, hey, call the librarian. She'll look that stuff up for you. And he thought, you know, God, I'm kind of busy here. And the Lord said, hey, call the librarian. I'm going to help you out here. So he did it. This is what happened. So he calls the librarian, and she immediately said, oh, yeah, it's because Russians use wormwood for medicinal purposes. Wormwood turns the tongue black, and the Russian word for black is cherny. So consequently, when they discovered this, they began calling Wormwood Chernobyl. 
and it's really pretty awesome. Now they have the um, Wormwood Memorial devoted to the, at the Chernobyl nuclear accident, they've got the Wormwood Memorial that's devoted to the, um, the uh, what are they called? They're called uh, liquidators. In the United States, we would call the ambulance and the policemen and everybody first responders that show up on the scene of an accident. Well, over there in the Ukraine and Russia, they're called liquidators. Well, they've got a huge memorial made to them, and it's called the Wormwood Memorial. And it's not a prophecy. It's totally secular. But it's going right along with this prophecy. So think about that. So the librarian's answer to my father-in-law, she... she um, and it was just quite astounding. I mean, it surprised him. And he said, he said to her to compile, he asked her, hey, can you give me some document, documentation from books and pages and numbers to get back with him? And of course she did. About 20 minutes later, she got back with him with books and page numbers and there was information and it documented everything uh, that she had told him. Well, one reference was the dictionary of the Russian language. And it listed... Chernobylnik, and it defined it as a variety of absinthe, which was in parentheses, wormwood with a red, brown, or deep purple stem. I've, I actually have a picture of it here uh, with me today. And very important because J remember, John was just doing the best he could to describe a vision that would happen 2,000 years in the future. And then Chernobyl was the, you, you know, Chernobyl was the worst nuclear accident in the history of the world up until right now. Now, there's going to come a world war in the future. It's going to be nuclear. That's something different. But when we're talking about Chernobyl, at that point, it, up until right now even, it's the worst nuclear disaster ever in the history of the world. Before it was over, the Chernobyl explosion had released 10 times as much nuclear radiation as had been released with the bombing of the Hiroshima in World War II. Ten times on one nuclear plant. At that time, two workers were, they were unaware of what was going on. They heard the explosion. They ran towards the source of the sound. And as they opened the door, the heat from the nuclear fire hit them right in the face and they just fell to the floor. By the time they were finally able to get up and, and get to a nurse's station, which is a miracle, it was almost a block away. Their skin was hanging off of them in ribbons, and of course they died shortly thereafter. And because of this level of emergency, there were fire trucks that came to the scene from everywhere. Uh, the firefighters didn't realize what they were really fighting. It was a nuclear fire. And many who arrived on the scene to help died within... Uh, just, just a few days, in, in about 30 days or so, pretty much all of them had passed away. And there was just a few to survive, and they suffered multiple ramifications from their exposure to these high levels of radiation. Well, over time, bulldozers had to be brought in to bury the equipment because it had become so contaminated with radiation, nobody could ever use it. It was just sitting everywhere. So in the process, those bulldozers had actually absorbed so much radiation that they had to bring more bulldozers in to bury the previous bulldozers. So the radiation was so high, even the helicopters that were brought in to dump water on the fires, it was contaminated and they had to be buried. I mean, the, the nuclear fire shot one mile into the air that much of an explosion and it, be, it really they're, they're out around the area it became a graveyard of radioactive bulldozers and helicopters and emergency vehicles and it was just unbelievable and so um, the Chernobyl nuclear plant the entire town became a ghost town the 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 town of Pripyat once had a population of like 40,000 people where most of the Chernobyl workers lived well, it became uninhabitable. But the prophecy from Revelation 8, 10 through 11 said that the star by the name of Wormwood was cast into the earth. So when the nuclear cloud was driven one mile into the air, the winds caught the cloud and carried it 
First it went to Sweden, then it went to Italy, into Germany, then into Great Britain. And it rained incessantly during this time. And we're not, we're not sure whether or not the explosion had anything to do with the rain, but it rained continuously for about four or five days after this. And as a result, all of the nuclei, six cesium-137 was brought down to the earth, which is like the worst case scenario. I guess it's really the, all a worst case scenario, but rather than keep on blowing, the rain brought it down. But the problem is that, that created another big problem. Everywhere the rain hit, it created brownouts. And because of this, there are many places throughout Europe where nothing will be able to grow for 100 years. And <clears throat> furthermore, the rivers filled up with this new Clyde 137 and any who drank the water and ingested it, when the new Clyde is ingested, it goes into a person's bone marrow and the rain brought it down into the waters of Europe and it was so radioactive, so everything it touched became radioactive. And about 100,000 reindeer that were being raised for consumption throughout Europe had to be killed because they became radioactive. And the people in the areas around Pripyat and this part of the, um, and, and that part of Ukraine, they have developed about 248 times the normal rate of thyroid cancer. That's when um, we had Fukushima, the, the, the uh, big nuclear um, plant that blew up over, I think it was in Japan or China, everybody on our west coast was buying those iodide pills because it keeps you from getting thyroid cancer because they remembered Chernobyl. And so many people today, they continue to suffer because of the, the effects of Chernobyl. It's got a huge afterlife, like a, a half-life of like 30 years. So right now, well over 100,000 people have died, and it is estimated that about 2 million people are affected and all of these results have been a direct result of this unprecedented nuclear accident. So the question then becomes, of course, if Chernobyl was the third trumpet from Revelation 8, 10 through 11, and that sounded, let's see, when did that sound? April 26, 1986. When did the first and second trumpets occur? Now, <laughs> I know a lot of people teach that because if you read the beginning of Revelation chapter 8, you would think that the seals have to end and then the trumpets begin. But you've got to really study those first few verses of chapter 8 right there and then you understand the, um, the different accounts of the second coming in the battle of Armageddon told throughout the book of Revelation then you can see it's just one account ending and another account beginning. But if you don't understand this, then you would think, well, hold, wait, wait, you guys are saying that the, we're into the trumpets, but all of the seals are not finished yet. Again, that's why it's so important that you understand that the book of Revelation is not written in chronological order. It's just John's telling one story, an account of it, and then he decides, hey, I'm going to tell another account and then another account. And they all end at the same place, but they begin at different times. It is absolutely critical that you understand that if you're going to study the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation 8, verse 8 through 9 says, And the second angel sounded. Now, so remember, we've already proved the third angel was the Chernobyl nuclear accident. So I'm going to jump back and go through uh, the second and the first angel. So the second angel sounded, and as it was a great mountain burning with fire, was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood, third part of the creatures which were in the sea, and had life died, and the third part of the ships were destroyed. So what it meant by the third part of the ships were destroyed? Well, if you think about it, World War II is the greatest disaster the world has ever known. When you're talking about casualties and things, 52 million people died in World War II. So in light of what this prophecy reveals, 
we have to ask the question, how many ships participated in World War II and how many ships sank? So when my father-in-law, Irvin Baxter, was trying to piece all this together, he asked his research assistant, Kathy, uh, at that time, I, I, I'm, we're still in contact with her today. I think she's still up in near Richmond, Indiana somewhere. He asked her to research the information. And after many trips to several libraries, working with many research assistants at those libraries, Kathy came back to Irvin and presented the results. She said there were 105,127 ships that participated in World War II. And of those, 36,387 ships sank. And my father-in-law said, okay, yeah, right, Kathy. You, you, I didn't tell you to go cook the books for me to prove this prophecy. What'd you come up with? She said, I'm, she said I, this is what I come up with. I worked with many librarians through many libraries. That's back before, um, it was right about when computers were starting to get popular. I mean, this is way back. And she said, these are the actual results. They, we, we got them from so many books. We did so much research. And if you calculate these quantities you'll find that the total ships that sank equaled about one-third of the total that participated. It goes right along with the prophecy. Now, the rest of the prophecy in Revelation 8, 8 through 9, says that there would be a great mountain burning with fire cast into the sea. Now, you've got to remember that John is telling, he's doing his best to describe an event that would occur 2,000 years in the future. And so think about it. He said, I saw a great mountain burning with fire cast into the sea. So we've seen pictures of, of nuclear explosions, right? They look like a huge mountain of fire. And so it appears that that's what John was seeing. But um, I tell you what, well, I'm going to hold right here. And when we get back from the break, uh, I'll get back into some more of these prophecies. But... Whatever you do, don't forget the conference coming up this weekend down in Houston, 60 degrees on Saturday. I'll meet you guys down there. Move Mountains with Irvin Baxter. This book by Irvin's grandson provides 30 days of devotion that will enhance your relationship with God and others. Authentic illustrations from early morning devotions at end time will help you find your purpose and eliminate fears. Commit to taking this 30-day journey and experience real life change. Get your book for only $14.99. Call 1-800-363-8463 or go to endtime.com slash move. Major internet companies are silencing and censoring Christian voices online. These companies are trying to control what you see and hear. Almost 200 videos of ours have been marked as restricted online right now. That's why we launched End of the Age Plus, a platform where the truth won't be censored, a platform where we can preach the message of the gospel. When you subscribe to End of the Age Plus today for just $12.99 a month, you can watch all of our content in a secure, easy-to-view way from your favorite device. When you go to watch.endtime.com and subscribe, you'll get instant access to all of our teaching resources, including Revelation, the Unveiling of Jesus Christ, Understanding the End Time, End Time Magazine, and so much more. We will not censor our message to comply with what the world deems as politically correct. Go to watch.endtime.com right now or search End of the Age Plus in the App Store or Google Play. If your station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com and click the watch button to continue today's broadcast. You can also finish up later by clicking the archive button. So <clears throat> we've all seen pictures of nuclear explosions, right? I mean, they look like, they do look like a huge mountain of fire. And the events of World War II were so catastrophic, it isn't far-fetched to believe the Bible would prophesy about them, right? I mean, events that we, would, we wouldn't be able to miss. So the nuclear explosion at Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the sinking of one-third of the ships that participated makes it seem obvious that the second trumpet 
was World War II. Now, I'm, I, I don't have time to go through the entire prophecy and all the details, but uh, it's, it's pretty evident once you go through all of it. So if the second trumpet was World War II, then of course we have to consider World War I was the first trumpet, right? Revelation 8, 7, the first angel sounded, there followed hail and fire and mingled with blood, and they were cast out upon the earth, and a third part of the trees was burned up, and the green grass was burned up. So up until the 20th century, there had never really been a war with anywhere near the casualties of World War I. World War I was considered the Great War because it, by the time it ended, 8.2 million people had died. It was totally unprecedented in the history of the world. Consider the kind of equipment that was used to fight World War I, bombs and huge guns. It was the first time some of these things had ever been introduced into a war-type scenario. Uh, it was the first time poisonous gas, submarines, aerial bombardment were ever used during a war. And this prophecy states, all the green grass was burnt up. So do you remember when you were in school studying about the scorched earth policy back in World War I? Most of World War I was fought between France and Germany. The scorched earth policy said that, hey, if you guys go in, you lose territory, you don't leave them anything, and you burn everything up so no resources are left for the enemy to live off of the ground. World War I was the first time biological weapons were ever used. It was, it was unprecedented warfare. And because of this evidence, we have come to the conclusion that World War I was the first trumpet. So, the first trumpet, World War I, with 8.2 million dead. In 6,000 years of recorded human history, there had never been a war that comes anywhere near this amount of casualties. The second trumpet, World War II, with 52 million dead. One third of the ships destroyed and a great mountain burning with fire. I mean, it fits everybody. And then the third trumpet was the Chernobyl nuclear accident. Now, all three were significant and catastrophic events that changed the course of history. And if the first three trumpets were, um, as has been indicated, then we can know about the trumpets four, five, six, and seven, right? I mean, what, what can we know about them? Well, I'm going to present these trumpets in the same way as I did the first three. I'm going to do them out of order again because that's the order that God revealed these prophecies to Irvin Baxter. And I can't improve on that. <laughs> it's not going to get any better than that, everybody. I mean, this is how he, God revealed it to my father-in-law. That's how I've got to teach it. So we're going to skip from the first, and we're going to go all the way to the fifth trumpet, and then we'll hit the fourth, then sixth, and seventh. And that, I'm telling you, it really helps you to understand once you go through these. So Revelation 9, verse 1 through 2 says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. There arose a great smoke out of the pit. And as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air were darkened by the reason of smoke of the pit. Now, again, you've got to understand, John, 2,000 years ago, never seen an automobile, never seen a, 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 a train, never saw a helicopter, never saw anything like that. I mean, he's, they're riding around on donkeys and stuff and walking everywhere. Well, he's trying to describe the best way he can modern-day warfare, 2,000 years in the future. Imagine trying to do that today. If you were, you know, which obviously we don't have 2,000 years left, but imagine something 2,000 years in the future, God shows you a vision, and you've got to describe it the best you can. Well, that's what John was doing here. So, in... 1991, Saddam Hussein, he was then the president of Iraq. He invaded Kuwait to take control of the oil riches in that area. Iraq was already very rich in oil themselves, but by obtaining the oil from Kuwait, that would provide the increased riches needed to rebuild Babylon. And that was the plan 
towards which Saddam Hussein had already launched efforts. He was taking pictures of himself in chariots trying to look like Nebuchadnezzar and he was building buildings that he thought, hey, this would be kind of like the Babylonian Empire. So in the fall of 1990, the coalition forces led by the United States fought against Hussein and began to drive him out of Kuwait. Well, Hussein knew that he could not win against the firepower of the United States and, and the U.S. allies. So before he withdrew, though, he set 700 of the world's richest oil wells ablaze. And when these oil wells began to burn, the smoke from the fires produced that these fires produced, they actually blocked the sun and the sky for over three months. And the middle of the day in the desert looked like midnight. So this information is very significant because the Bible says the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, we're not aware of any other event in history that could fulfill this particular prophecy so precisely. I mean, consider the rest of the passage, Revelation 9, uh, 3. It says, And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them were given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And th this is verse, what, 7 through 9. The Bible says, that the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared for battle. Again, John's describing modern day war implements 2,000 years ago. He said, in the shapes of these locusts, they were like unto horses un coming unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns of like gold, and their faces were faces like men, and they had hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of, of lions, and they had breastplates and breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings were like the chariots of, of many horses running to battle. So it is possible. Have you ever seen a helicopter or a bunch of helicopters coming? First of all, their wings, their, the prop on top, it does sound like chariots running to battle. Think about it. And when you've ever heard a bunch of helicopters coming, and it is possible that John saw helicopters or jet airplanes Think about it. He said, have you ever seen a helicopter that looks like a locust? Uh, I mean, I'm talking about a military helicopter. The prophecies John wrote about were representing, represented by multiple symbols. And it is not far-fetched to think that these symbols do indeed represent helicopters, jet airplanes. And he had never seen this kind of machinery. So he couldn't know exactly what they were, right? He couldn't write and said, hey, I saw helicopters coming out of the smoke. He was just, he was writing this unbelievable event that happened. And this is how he came up with it. And, but the, what, what happened during the Iraq war fits perfectly. He described these things as, uh, uh, let's look at a, a military helicopter as locusts with breastplates of iron, faces of men, and the sound of their wings as it was the sound of chariots going to battle. So it appears as if John was describing warfare from the 20th century. <clears throat> now, from this evidence, we have come to the conclusion that the fifth trumpet sounded at the time of these events from 1990 and 1991. And so that lets us know that the first five trumpets have already occurred. I mean, the, um, we've already covered the trumpets one, two, three, and five, right? But we got to get to four. So the fifth trumpet, Iraq war with Saddam Hussein, 9091. Now, the Revelation chapter 8, verse 12 says, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, third part of the moon, third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. So, in, back in Matthew, chapter 24, verse 22, Jesus said, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days should be shortened. 
So the question is, when did the fourth trumpet sound? Well, this is kind of unique, and you got to follow me on this one, because this is probably the hardest one <clears throat> to figure out. And God actually revealed. So my mother and father-in-law, both very spiritual people, pray every day, study God's word, follow God's voice. They've done that since they were both teenagers, okay? So when either one of them, my mother-in-law, Judy, or my father-in-law, Irvin, when they would say, God spoke to me, everybody stopped and listened because they're very spiritual people. Now, God revealed this prophecy to my mother-in-law. So I'm going to give you the account that my father-in-law, Irvin Baxter, has told me many times and we've taught it in lessons and different things, but this is the best way I have to explain it. Because they, my, God revealed this to my father-in-law and um, to my mother-in-law prior to me even coming to End Time Ministries. I was still working out in the corporate world at that point. So my father-in-law said, okay, Dave, here's the deal. I was trying to figure this out. I didn't understand the prophecy for quite some time. And... His wife was always concerned for, obviously, her husband couldn't figure this out. He was, he was like, God, you got to help me. So out of concern for my father-in-law about this issue, my mother-in-law was praying and asking God, please give my husband the answer. Well, one day after she had been shopping, okay, she came home and she told Irvin that the Lord had spoken to her about this prophecy. And he said to her, she said, Lord, when are you going to reveal the prophecy of the shortening of the days? He said, I've already shortened the days. So after much consideration about whether God had shortened the amount of the days or the length of the days, a lot of people kind of get twisted up on that. And it is a question. It's a legit question. Well, my father-in-law realized that God wasn't saying that he had shortened the amount of the days. How did he know that? Well, he knew that because of what Daniel chapter 12, verse 11 through 12 says. Daniel said, and from the time that the daily sacrifice was taken away. Now, he's talking about the abomination of desolation here. At the time that the daily sacrifice was taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate is set up, there's going to be 1,290 days. So there's going to be 1,290 days from the time of the abomination of desolation to the battle of Armageddon. But the passage goes on to say, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,335th day. So the abomination has not occurred yet. <laughs> so God wouldn't contradict his word nor change his word. The Bible says, Thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. So this convinced my father-in-law that God would not change the number of days but that he was going to shorten the day. So when we get back, we'll talk about it some more. Most of us walk around day by day blind to the prophecies being fulfilled right before us. Every news report brings a new piece to the puzzle in the race towards the final seven years and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, more than ever, it is important for God's people to understand the times in which we are living. On November the 12th, 2013, we opened our Jerusalem Prophecy College in downtown Jerusalem. These same courses are now available online for people who are unable to attend the classes in person. We welcome students to join us and discover the link between current events and the prophecies of the Bible. Take your place in the prophecy of Daniel 1133. Enroll in the Jerusalem Prophecy College today. Go to JerusalemProphecyCollege.com. So from this, <clears throat> it, it appeared that what God had told my mother-in-law, what he meant by that was that he had shortened the amount of the time of each day. Well, my father-in-law said that he wasn't aware of any evidence that would prove that that had happened. He was really studying. He actually felt sure that there was evidence to prove that it had not happened. He couldn't see from all the things he was studying. 
that if the amount of time in each day had been shortened, the clocks would move faster and men would be, uh, it would be no longer able to run a four minute mile, right? Since a mile remains the same distance and man cannot run any faster, if time is shortened, it would now take a person five minutes or so to run a four minute mile, right? So anyone with a, a background in engineering would understand this type of stuff. You'd have to try to figure all this out. But about a week later, Irvin and his wife were eating in a restaurant. A professor from Richmond, Indiana, who followed a lot of our end time teaching material, he was there. And when he saw Irvin Baxter and his wife, he went over to them. My mother-in-law asked him about what she had felt that God had spoke to her about the mathematical equation at, that Irvin had shared with her about the four-minute mile and this, that, and the other. And so he asked her if she, he, he, she said, yeah, Judy, that could work. Have you understood, uh, do you understand Einstein's theory of relativity? E equals MC squared. And that explains that time and speed, um, that when one speeds up, the other speeds up. Time and speed. When, when time speeds up, the other one speeds up. So about a week later, in a phone conversation with another friend who had an engineering background, Irvin Baxter explained the conversation between he and his wife. He brought up Einstein's theory of relativity as well. The engineering friend did. He said, Irvin, don't you understand Einstein's theory of relativity? That's very easily proven. So Irvin did buy a few books on Einstein's theory of relativity. I actually have one of the original books that he bought here with me. They gave that to me after he passed away. But he never got around to reading the theory of relativity. But we've had many people talk to us about it over the years. And based on the information that his friends shared concerning Einstein's theory of relativity and all the research we've been able to do, it appears that my mother-in-law, Irvin's wife, her name's Judy, that she was right all along. God did, in fact, talk to her. So we know the third trumpet sounded in 86 with the Chernobyl nuclear accident. We also understand the fifth trumpet sounded during 1991, the Saddam Hussein um, conflict. So the fourth trumpet had to have sounded sometime between 86 and 91, right? So what major event happened during that time that was related to the days being shortened? Well, in 1968, God revealed to Irvin Baxter that the Berlin Wall would come down, Germany would reunite, and that would be the beginning of the New World Order. And it would be a historical turning point, right? I mean, Irvin actually put this book in, uh, put this information in his first book, which was published in 1986, A Message for the President. And that's really what launched End Time Ministries. And this revelation is what prompted him to start End Time Magazine back in 91 because he felt that it was the beginning of the end time, really. In 1989, in reference to the 10th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the beginning of the New World Order, Merrill Lynch printed a full-page ad in USA Today, and it said, the world is 10 years old today. Congratulations, happy birthday. They said it started in 89. So Irvin was also listening to a speech by um, Mr. Tony Blair, founder of the Tony Blair Foundation, and he said globalization began with the fall of the Berlin Wall. The fall of the Berlin Wall was a pivotal event in history. So he wondered if that could have been the time when God sped everything up. And though an actual event that coincides with the amount of time in a day being shortened remains unclear, Irvin believed the event had to have happened around the same time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. The uh, London School of Economics and Political Science, they published an article titled, uh, The Global 89, The Year That Changed the World. And they said this, and I'll quote, as such, the shifts and reconfigurations of social, economic, and political power associated with 1989 Dramatic and extensive though these have been, remain locked primarily within existing rational, relational configurations. To put this in old language, 
the organic tendencies of the old have reasserted themselves in a new context and on a vaster scale. 1989 may have sped up world historical time, but it marked neither its end nor its beginning. Rather like the bionic man, the post-1989 era is quicker, stronger, faster. We have seen the acceleration of the means of organizing politics, economics, and social life, but not their reformulation. So in our opinion, the fourth trumpet began right around the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. So that's why we say many times we've taught that the first five trumpets have already occurred. I know there are people that teach these have to, have to, during the, have to happen during the final seven years, seals, trumpets, and vials. But you've got to understand that these things have been opened for years now. So, question is, has the sixth trumpet occurred yet? The answer to that is absolutely no. The sixth trumpet, the Battle of Armageddon, two separate wars. We've taught lessons on that over the years. I'll probably have to teach that again because I'm getting a lot of questions about that right now uh, from what's going on in the Middle East, the situation with Israel, United States, Iran, Russia, China, and everything that's going on there. So what's the, what's the sixth trumpet war, the sixth angel? Well, Revelation 9, 13 through 16. And I chose the New Living Translation. Almost everything we do here is King James Version. But sometimes when it's a little bit more explanatory, I might choose another version. That's what I did here. New Living Translation. The Bible says, Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice speaking from the four horns of the golden altar that stands in the presence of God. And the voice said to the sixth angel who held his trumpet, release the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And then the four angels who had been prepared for this hour, a day, a month, and a year were turned loose to kill one third of all the people on the earth. Okay, I'm going to read that again. Loose to kill one third of all the people on the earth. Not the people involved in the war, but one third of the entire earth's population. I heard the size of the army, which was 200 million mounted troops. So this prophecy tells us three things. Number one, there's going to be a war that kills one third of the mankind. 2.5, 2.7 billion people if it occurred right now. The war is going to start from the Euphrates River region, which is in the Middle East. And number three, the number of the armies that will participate will be 200,000 or 200 million men. The Bible says the war will start from the Euphrates River, that four angels are bound in this river. When these angels are loosed, that war will include 200 million man army and it's going to kill one third of all of mankind. The Euphrates River starts up in Turkey, flows down through Syria and through Iraq, and finally... Um, it, it, when, it, when it empties into the Persian Gulf, then that's where the borders of Iraq and Iran meet, clear down here. So the, the, it's, it's housed in um, four nations, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, and Iran. And you know as well as I do, there continues to be a, a, this tremendous amount of turmoil in the Middle East. And it doesn't look like it's going to end anytime soon, right? There are many people that believe World War III has already begun. It just hasn't escalated to the point where it would become a world war. And I've talked about scenarios recently about the, the Iran and China and Russia and the United States and Israel and what's going on with the Abraham Accords and all of these security agreements that they're signing. So the U.S. has tens of thousands of troops stationed in the Middle East along the Euphrates River and... 100% of the river runs through Middle Eastern territory, Muslim territory mainly. So it seems obvious that the Islamic faction with 1.5 to 1.6 billion people will be involved in this war, right? I mean, it's going to start right there in that area. So <clears throat> Islam, China, and India have enough population to field 200 million soldiers. So will this 200 million men army be from Islam, China, or India? Well, it is possible. It could, it could happen. It, uh, India could participate, but it will, 
it's, it's possible that both Islam and China could participate in the war since the war is going to kill one third of all of humanity, right? I mean, the Bible says that it, it's going to happen um, and it will happen before the Battle of Armageddon, two separate wars. Don't get them confused when you're reading Zechariah chapter uh, 12, 13, and 14, or Ezekiel 38, 39, Revelation 9, 13 through 16, and then all of the stuff about the Battle of Armageddon. You can't get all this confused. And so Revelation 9, verse 13 through 16, is the only prophecy about the Sixth Trumpet War. All of these other ones that we're talking about, these end-time war, that's the Battle of Armageddon, okay? So you got to make sure that you get all these things right because you're going to have one big giant war happen in the future where the Bible, Bible prophesies two of them. So with conditions as they are, it could happen at any moment. We know that. Why? The first five, five trumpets have already occurred. This is the sixth trumpet. And it happens that this event will be catastrophic enough to be the one that sounds the sixth trumpet. Well, that brings us to the seventh trumpet. Revelation 11, 15 through 18 says, And the seventh angel sounded, there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the nations were angry, Thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and thou shouldest give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So this is what we've all been waiting for, right? I mean, when the seventh trumpet sounds, the kingdoms of this world are going to become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. God's wrath's going to come. Rewards will be given to the saints. And this is the second coming of Jesus Christ, the seventh trumpet. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17 gives another account of the last trumpet. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall rise first. My father-in-law is going to rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet them in the clouds. I'm going to see my father-in-law again someday. And we're going to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The most critical thing about this prophecy, about the seventh trump, is the rapture, everybody. Romans 8 11 says concerning those which want to be part of the rapture, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. To be in the rapture, you've got to make sure you have received the Holy Ghost and the Holy Ghost is the power that will raise you up in that last day. Folks, this is the seven trumpets and this will help you understand the book of Revelation is not written in chronological order. So make sure you understand the first five trumpets have already occurred, and we've got two more coming, the sixth trumpet, sixth trumpet war, and then the one we've all been waiting for, the seventh trumpet, the return of Jesus. This has been End of the Age, brought to you by the faithful partners of End Time Ministries. If you're not currently a partner with End Time Ministries, or if you would like more information, we invite you to call us at 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463, or visit us online at endtime.com. Thank you for watching. If you liked this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and like our Facebook page.